This is Long Wave, featuring technical analysis and market analytics by Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. The content of this presentation is strictly the opinion of Gordon T. Long and is based on his analysis, which he feels to be accurate and unbiased. Participants may or may not hold positions in any securities that are discussed. You should always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decisions. Now, let's join Gordon for today's show. Good morning. It is Tuesday, July the 9th, 2013. I'm Gord Long at GordonTLong.com. As usual, I have a lot of charts for us to go through this morning, so therefore I will pass over some of them quickly and leave you to examine them further at your leisure. You'll need to open your slide viewer to full screen viewing or you'll not be able to see some of the detail I'll be discussing. A reminder before we begin, do not trade from any of these slides. They are commentary for educational and discussion purposes only. The purpose of the audio slides is to talk about the areas that are not updated in your monthly analytics and technical analysis report. This is based on our annual cycle as outlined on the subscriptions page on our site. We intentionally keep the technical analysis charts to the subscriber report so as not to confuse them with the drivers operating behind them. Drivers in the long term are primarily the fundamentals, in the intermediate term risk, and the short term confidence and sentiment. In this regard, I want to talk today about first second quarter earnings trends and surprises, second the sector messages we are seeing so far from four specific areas, third margin and credit and how they are impacting the equity markets, fourth some realities in the gold market, and finally a technical test that I would suggest we all watch very closely. We are presently in the midst of a consolidation. We feel there is more downside still in front of us before we reach an intermediate bottom. We will then advance to complete a long-term top. The technical charts for this are in your monthly matter report document, though I will conclude this morning with one specific technical chart. On the off chance there is still any confusion about what would happen should the Fed actually step away, the whole taper discussion is a planned scare and nothing more than a demonstration that the central bank expansion of balance sheets cannot be stopped without massive market dislocations. It is cover for the next round of dramatic increases in their balance sheets. The amount of leverage now in the market is such that the collateral contagion that would ensue would be a disaster if bond and equity prices were to fall more than uh, I would suggest a normal 2% standard deviation correction, or about 8 to 10%. This is a great graphic, which comes from The Economist. It depicts world GDP on a year-over-year -year basis for the world, high-income countries, the BRICS, and other emerging markets. The Economist estimates that world growth slowed to a 2.1% pace in Q1 2013, down a full percentage point from Q1 2012. The high-income countries are barely growing net-net. Europe is largely in recession. U.S. growth in Q1 has been revised lower. The prospects for Q2 look poor. U.S. growth has not improved, though the Eurozone contraction may have eased. It still appears to be contracting. Japanese growth is likely to lead again with both exports and domestic consumption continuing to recover. Emerging markets often grow faster than high-income countries, though it does not always lead to superior asset returns. The BRICs have slowed, as have other emerging markets. The sharp rise in global interest rates starting in late May will not help matters. The increase in interest rates is not a reflection of a greater demand for capital due to increased activity. Rather, the rise in rates reflects portfolio adjustments in response to the tapering talk the U.S. less stimulus is not the same thing as no stimulus, continued selling of foreign assets by Japanese investors, and the liquidity squeeze in China. There does remain a reasonable chance that global growth may pick up marginally in Q3 or Q4 but we have some issues between now and then. 
The U.S. macro surprise is showing we have extended about as far as we can without some adjustment. That adjustment has begun, but has much more to go and will likely be centered around the disappointing forward earnings guidance we are going to see over the next few weeks. There's been an awful lot of bellyaching about the Federal Reserve possibly beginning to taper or gradually reduce its stimulus bond buying program. Some have attributed the risk of the taper to the return of volatility in the stock markets. But this volatility may be explained more directly by a larger, more theoretically sound reason, deteriorating earnings expectations. According to City Tobias Levekovich, in a note to clients, and I quote, Earnings matter the most for equities, in our opinion, and there is relatively robust statistical evidence to back up that contention. In this respect, we have been a tad shocked by the surge in negative to positive pre-announcement trends that make 2009 surge appear less worrisome in retrospect. Upward earnings guidance has dipped as well, and there has been little consternation or no discussion about it. Fact sets John Butters examined this trend closely recently with regard to the quarter that just ended, and again I quote, For Q2 2013, 87 companies have issued negative earnings per share guidance, and 21 companies have issued positive earnings per share guidance. If this is the final percentage for the quarter, it will mark the highest percentage of companies issuing negative earnings per share guidance for a quarter. Although the number of negative pre-announcements is running at an all-time high, the market is not punishing the performance of these stocks in the short term according to Butters. He also says, for the 87 companies that have issued negative earnings per share guidance for Q2 2013 to date, the average price two days before the guidance was issued through two days after the guidance was issued was positive 0.1%. The percentage is well above the average of negative 1.2% over the past five years. The weirdest thing about this is that this trend has been getting worse for years and the stock market has only been going up. According to Citi, and again I quote, while we envisage an improving U.S. economic backdrop assisting estimates, we are more concerned about the international activity trends with Europe, China, Brazil potentially generating disappointing alongside commodity-driven economies that may have been banking on better business activity as well. As we head into earnings seasons in the U.S. amid hopeful margin expansion, the big picture for earnings to me remains bleak. Markets are back close to highs as negative guidance is piling up and global earnings revision index is at its worst since early July 2012. If the Fed is heading towards a taper, then this fundamental fear may once again become relevant or hope-fueled multiple expansion will fill that gap. This puts the earnings reporting game into clear perspective. The market needs to adjust to reality. Corporations have been investing in top-line growth. They are not getting it. You can only play accounting games, cut staffing from full-time to part-time, and remove benefits for so long before it shows up on the bottom line. The analysts move as a pack, and as yet they, have, they haven't moved on their hockey stick. This chart simply shows the problem that will eventually be corrected, or must be corrected. Wondering how the blowout in interest rates is impacting commercial banks, which just happen to have substantial duration exposure in the form of various treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, not to mention loans, structured products, and, of course, trillions in interest rate swap, derivatives, and futures? Wonder no more. Fed's weekly H8 statement, and specifically the net unrealized gains and losses on available for sale securities of commercial banks in the U.S., gives us a glimpse into the pounding that banks are currently experiencing. In short, it's a bloodbath. After crashing from $15 billion to just $6 billion, the reported balance of net unrealized gains is barely positive for just the first time since April 2011. And to think this number had topped out at over $43 billion in December 2012. But the worst is that the monthly drop in gains of $24 billion is the biggest by a wide margin since the Lehman collapse. Note the crash in the long-term chart on the right. The skeptics will say $6 billion. Big deal. The Fed did almost that much in POMO in one week. 
The issue, however, is that the AFS, that is the available for sale line, which runs through the accumulated other comprehensive income line as the last thing banks, well, this is the last thing banks want, is for MTM or mark to market to crush their reported bottom line um, and is merely a proxy for how rising rates impact on a snapshot basis the consolidated balance sheet of U.S. banks, which at last check had $7.3 trillion in loans and leases, still below pre-Lehman levels, not to mention countless other undisclosed instruments that represent their London Whale equivalent prop positions funded with customer deposits. In other words, the shorthand is to look at the massacre that is going on in the AFS line and extrapolate it to all the other leveraged commercial bank and hedge fund rate exposure. Expect math, PhD, program, get-go, algos that determine the marginal momentum of the S&P to figure this out sometime over the next mm, two to three weeks once banks begin reporting results that are not quite in line with expectations. Ever since 2009, the U.S. financial system effectively suspended mark-to-market accounting for the too-big-to-fail and other banks, and that was per the FASB 157 and 115 rules. The income statement impact, i.e. net income above the other comprehensive income line, of wild interest rates moves on balance sheets have been one thing U.S. banks have not had to worry about. The reason for this is the transformation of large swaths of rate-sensitive holdings, the vast majority of bank assets, on the balance sheet to held to maturity, meaning no matter how much higher or lower interest rates move, banks would be immune from flowing mark-to-market losses or gains through the income statement. Yet despite best efforts to immunize banks from the rate swings and debt mark-to-market risk, a substantial amount of duration exposure has remained with the glorified hedge funds known as FDIC-insured bank holdings companies under the designation of available for sale, or AFS, or those which, due to their explicit short-term trading fate, would have to subject to -to mark-to-market moves. It is the bottom line impact of these securities that threatens to crush bank earnings in the just concluded second quarter by amount that could be as large as twenty five billion or more. As an aside, it is technically not true that banks are devoid of gap rate and duration risk. Over the past four years, banks had found themselves in the paradoxical situation where blowing out spreads impacting credit instruments, debt and credit default swaps, due to systematic or industry-specific rate shifts, actually resulted in a boost to the adjusted bottom line since the so-called DVA impact had to be netted out from pro forma net income, leading to a non-GAAP earnings per share bonanza when things got really rough. However, a bigger issue is what happens to banks in a time when rates surge violently and dramatically in a short period of time, such as in the past few weeks. In places like Japan, the rapid blowout in yields, with the 10-year hitting 1% coinciding with the peak of the Nikkei 225 so far in 2013, has a massive adverse impact on banks, and where a 1% parallel shift in the curve may lead to as much as 35 impairment in bank capital. But how about the U.S.? After all, while the Fed is the single largest holder of treasuries, and whose P&L suffered a massive $20 billion, or four times its capital loss in June alone, courtesy of the effable faith in fiat, Bernanke has no mark-to-market restrictions, at least until such time as they reserve currency status of the U.S. dollar is questioned, and so is the faith of the U.S. central bank. But that is a topic for another day. U.S. banks do have substantial duration exposure to the tune of hundreds of billions, primarily concentrated in the spring-loaded clip known as Available for Sale AFS Securities. So, just how large is the said duration exposure? According to J.P. Morgan, it's quite substantial and amounts to a whopping $30 billion in mark-to-market losses for every 1% increase in yields. Or in other words, the Q2 blowout in the 10 years should have resulted in a 20 to 30 billion loss to the U.S. financial system's bottom line. 
through the accumulated other comprehensive income line. In the second, in, that was in the second quarter alone. All else equal, and for a hyper-levered system in which everything is contingent on smaller and smaller rates, all else is never equal, implying many more adverse downstream effects will likely be revealed. We can infer banks' duration exposure by relating week-to-week -week changes in unrealized gains to week-to-week -week changes in the yield of our U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, the GABI. Figure 3 shown here shows this beta, estimated over a rolling six-month window to smooth through the noise in the estimate. It suggests that banks would make mark-to-market losses on their available for sale portfolios of just under $30 billion for each 1% increase in yield. Estimating the beta over three months would give very similar results. That beta is around twice as large as in 2010, whereas the size of the bank's bond portfolios have increased by only around 20% over that period, implying that banks in aggregate have been shifting towards longer maturity securities. The beta of just under $30 billion for a 1% rise in yield implies that 18 basis point rise in the GABI yield since the last H8 report would have reduced unrealized gains by a further $5.4 billion. Oops. This is precisely why when everyone is scrambling to chase yields and in the process increases duration to preserve some NIM in a centrally planned, manipulated, collapsing rate environment, resulting in doubling of bank duration exposure beta in under three years, any rapid inverse move will leave everyone with massive losses, losses that may be as much as $30 billion or more. Putting this number in perspective, according to the FDIC, in Q1, banks recorded profits of $40 billion. There goes half of Q1 profits. But while the U.S. losses may be manageable, if crushing to sell-side analysts who have bet the farm, once again incorrectly, on the S&P 500 earnings picking up to Q2 due to a surge in financial profits, which are now locked far lower at June 28 10-year levels and resulting in billions in mark-to-market losses that will have to hit the net income line. It is things in Europe that are about to get nasty once again. U.S. banks have been modestly reducing their bond holdings since the start of May by around $19 billion overall. By contrast, Euro-area banks bought a hefty 48 billion euros in May, largely because Italian and Spanish banks added to their holdings as spreads edged wider. And while we don't have a convenient weekly update on banking sector unrealized losses in Europe as per the U.S. H8, it looks like the European peripheries Monte Carlo double down all in bluff may have just been called or in other words now that the carry trade tide has gone away we finally see how many european banks were swimming naked we can't help but wonder how many of their u.s brethren will join them with their pants down as bank results are reported over the next several weeks let's consider issues in china i picked on nike as an example Looking back at a decade of quarterly earnings reports, Nike has had 36 beats of analyst consensus out of 40 opportunities. The company's performance against the point spread was less impressive with stocks rising on just 27 occasions. It was last June that Nike saw its sharpest one-day share price drop in years after unveiling weak fourth quarter earnings and a sharp cut in futures. The culprit that time? Greater China. And it looks shaky again. The region is important, having made up a tenth of brand revenue and nearly a fifth of operating earnings through the first three fiscal quarters. Operating earnings there fell 15% year over year in that period, compared with a 23% rise in North American market. Management made cautious comments in March about reducing inventory in Greater China, an effort to reset the marketplace. The stumbles of local rivals Li Ning and Anta may have taken some pressures off Nike, the top sportswear brand in China, by sales. Nike's futures for China were positive 4% at the last quarterly update, still far better than the minus 8% for Japan and minus 5% for Western Europe, but worse than the positive 11% for North America. Management cautioned, though, that revenue in China may be lower than those forward orders indicated. 
Nike isn't priced for perfection, but at nearly 24 times trailing earnings, look expensive compared to its 10-year average of 20 times. The stock has returned 40% since its sharp stumble a year ago following the China warnings and has retreated only slightly more than the broad market from its spring high. Though the odds are poor when betting against Nike, this, this time seems ripe for an upset. Again, this is an example of the impacts on China. Let's talk about Alcoa and develop economies. Alcoa reported adjusted earnings because the unadjusted earnings were a disaster. Of 76 million or 7 cents on a consensus expectations of 6, at least by the print. In other words, a beat. So just how did the company beat its forecast? Here's how. A week ago, Alcoa was expected to make over 7 cents or the results would have been a miss. A month ago, over 10 cents. In January, 17 cents. Just over a year ago, 30 cents. In January 2011, Q2, 2000 earnings per share, was supposed to be almost 70 cents. 70 cents to 6 cents. So from January 2011 to today, the company's consensus earnings per share was revised from just under 70 cents to 6 cents. But hey, at least it beat. By the way, here is why the earnings per share number is absolutely meaningless. It excludes $244 million in restructuring charges, something which makes a complete mockery of both an apples-to-apples -apples comparison also and also the company's tax rate. Of course, not excluding the restructuring charges from net income would have meant a $148 million loss. But at least Alcoa provided $21 million in income taxes in Q2. As for what exactly mattered, here are the highlights. Revenue of $5.8 billion, down 1.9% year-over-year. CapEx $286 million, down 1.7% year-over-year. Free cash flow $228 million, down 7.3% year-over-year. But at least the company still sees a stable and growing China, expecting Chinese aluminum demand to rise 11% in 2013 versus 9% in 2012. Well, it's not like China is undergoing an unprecedented historic deleveraging or anything, so why not? Sounds like a plug number to me. Ahead of the earnings report and Alcoa outperforming after earnings beat release, and amid Alcoa's ongoing capacity reduction, the yawning chasm between production of aluminum and price continues to suggest significant pain ahead. With China and the Middle East seemingly unwilling to follow the market signals and reduce production, helped uneconomically by the respected governments, no doubt, the if-you-produce-it, demand-will-come view of the world is just not working out and frankly hasn't for 18 months. As Bloomberg reports, the market is still looking at overcapacity, overproduction, and an unprecedented overhang of metal. And furthermore, while prices have plunged 12% in recent weeks, there is doubt that producers will follow through on planned production cuts. Of course, we are sure the Alcoa CEO will soon be on CNBC to tell us how great it is and how the world economy is about to pick up. This chart suggests otherwise, but... He won't bring this chart, I'm sure. It seemed to make sense to some people and that if the Federal Reserve reined in monetary policy and caused interest rates to rise, then stocks would suffer as debt financing costs rose for corporations and consumers. Then again, the Fed would only allow rates to rise if it thought the economy was improving. When you look at the historical evidence, rising interest rates are associated with rising stock prices. Post-crisis periods of rising bond yields have tended to coincide with rising equities, according to UBS. But the pace of the interest rate surge has left many global stock markets in the deep red, as shown here. To quote UBS, we think it was the speed of the move that proved a problem as U.S. Treasuries rose from 1.6 to 2.6 over just eight weeks. The most remarkable thing about the market move since the May 6th low in interest rates is that the U.S. stock market, represented by the S&P 500, is actually up 3%. The New York Stock Exchange publishes end-of-month data for margin debt on the NYX Data website, where we can also find historical data back to 1959. 
Let's examine the numbers and study the relationship between margin debt and the margin using the S&P 500 as a surrogate for the latter. This work was done by Doug Short. The first chart shows the two series in real terms adjusted for inflation to today's dollar using the consumer price index as a deflator. He picked 1995 as the arbitrary start date. We were well into the boomer bull market that began in 1982 and approaching the start of the tech bubble that shaped investor sentiment during the second half of the decade. The astonishing surge in leverage in late 1999 peaked in March 2000, the same month that the S&P 500 hit its all-time daily high, although the highest monthly close for that year was five months later in August. A similar surge began in 2006, peaking in July 2007, three months before the market peak. The next chart shows the percentage growth of the two data series from the same 1995 starting date, again based on real inflation-adjusted data. He added markers to show the precise monthly values and added callouts to show the month. Margin debt grew at a rate comparable to the market from 1995 to late summer of 2000 before soaring into the stratosphere. The two synchronized in their rate of contraction in early 2001. But with recovery after the tech crash, margin debt gradually returned to a growth rate closer to its former self in the second half of the 1990s rather than more restrained real growth of the S&P 500. But by September of 2006, margin again went ballistic. It finally peaked in the summer of 2007, about three months before the market. After the market low of 2009, margin debt again went on a tear until the contraction in late spring of 2010. The summer doldrums promptly ended when Chairman Bernanke hinted of more quantitative easing in his August 2010 Jackson Hole speech. The appetite for margin instantly returned and the Fed has periodically increased the easing. Was April a margin debt peak? Unfortunately, the NYSE margin debt data is a few weeks old when it is published. In nominal terms, the real margin debt at the end of May 2013, the last available data, shows a slight month-over-month decline of 2.1%, 1.9% in nominal terms. Will we look back in April as a cyclical peak for margin debt like we saw in 2000 and 2007? And does that anticipate a major market peak as we saw twice in, two th- in the 21st century? Lance uh, Roberts, general partner and CEO of Street Talk Advisors, analyzes margin debt in a larger context and includes free cash accounts and credit balances in margin accounts. Essentially, he calculates the credit balance as the sum of the free credit cash accounts and credit balances in margin accounts minus margin debt. The chart here illustrates the mathematics of credit balance with an overlay of the S&P 500. Note that the chart is based on nominal data not adjusted for inflation. As Doug Short pointed out, the NYSE margin debt data is several weeks old when it is published. Thus, even though it may in theory be a leading indicator, a major shift in margin debt isn't immediately evident. Nevertheless, we see that the troughs in the monthly net credit balance preceded peaks in the monthly S&P closes by six months in 2000 and four months in 2007. The most recent S&P correction greater than 10% was the 19.4% sell-off in 2011 from April 29th to October 3rd. Investor credit hit a negative extreme in March 2011. There are too few peak trough episodes in this overlay series to take the latest credit balance trough as a definitive warning for U.S. equities, but we'll want to keep an eye on this metric over the next few months. A few quick comments on gold need to be made. The marginal cost of production of gold, 90 percentile, in 2013 was estimated at $1,300, including capital expenditures, which means that as of a few days ago, gold is now trading well below not only the cash cost, but is rapidly approaching the marginal cost of $1,104 per ounce, which means that the following mines, which make up the gold cost curve, one by one starting on the right and going left, production is going to go dark. Even without the recent demand by South African gold miner 
labor unions to have their wages doubled until eventually virtually no gold will be produced. It is at that point where one must apply the new normal supply and demand curve when one can predict a zero per ounce price for gold as physical demand continues unabated while actually physical, not paper production, has now, has now started going offline. All joking aside, not even Bernanke and all the paper gold ETFs in the world will be able to do much to suppress gold prices from reaching their fair value when gold production hits a standstill and when demand, especially by China, is still in the hundreds of tons each year. Frankly, China will import close to 1,800 tons this year in my estimation. Something happened recently that has not happened since the Lehman collapse. The one-month gold forward offer called GOFL rate turned negative from 0.015 to negative 0.065 for the first time in nearly five years, or technically since just after the Lehman bankruptcy precipitated AIG bailout in November 2011. And if one looks at the three-month GOFL, which also turned shockingly negative overnight from 0.05 to negative 0.03, one has to go back all the way to 1999 Washington Agreement on Gold to find the last time that the particular GOFL rate was negative. It may be one of many things, and I can list them as they go from an ETF-induced repricing of paper and physical gold to an ongoing bullion bank failure with or without an associated allocated gold bank run. But the answer, frankly, is just unknowable. What is known is that something very abnormal and even historic is afoot at the nexus of the gold fractional reserve lending market. Something is seriously amiss afoot here and needs to be watched very closely. This is the technical chart I mentioned earlier. We are testing the trend line for resistance. This is a classic pattern. If we fail to decisively break above it, then we are headed lower and much lower. Support will give us eventually our intermediate low before we rise to put in what I've all been calling for some time the long-term top that we are fast approaching and um, and this is the, the rise from November 2008 counter bear market rally in a secular bear market that we've been talking about ongoing for three years four years now in closing I'd like to take a moment as a reminder do not trade from any of these slides. They are for educational and discussion purposes only. Thank you for listening, and until next month, may 2013 be an outstanding investment year for you. Thank you for listening. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.